Hi, everyone. It's Ra going back with Mind Rolling, and I have Fleet Mall with me. Fleet, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Great to see you. Yeah, great to meet. We're just meeting everybody. So we're all going to get to know you, Fleet, as we go through the next hour. Uh, of course, to mention, uh, Fleet has a book called Radical Responsibility, and uh, it has chock full of many many advisals here and practices and uh, perspectives that would uh, help all of us to uh, move along our daily life with a little bit more grace, shall we say. Um, so I think we need to get right to it, though, Fleet. Fleet has an extraordinary uh, story, and uh, it, uh, it's astounding, really. And I'd, I'd love for you uh, to, to just tell the story of what happened and the subsequent uh, incarceration that you experienced. All right, well, I'll try to do it briefly. <laughs> um, I'm one of the baby boomers like yourself that grew up and came of age in the 1960s. And I was kind of a classic angry young man coming out of high school, graduated from high school in 1968, which was a very tumultuous year in U.S. history. And um, so I just went headlong into the common culture. And, uh, but I was, always, uh, I was always a spiritual seeker as well, had really been since, I mean, I remember my very early life being very magical. And, uh, and then kind of everything went to shades of gray, probably having to do with family problems and starting school and just different things. And maybe that's a normal developmental process, but I wasn't happy about it. I was always trying to find a way to replug into something that felt authentic and real to me. And of course, you know, um, drug, sex, and rock and roll looked like it and felt like it, but had its own baggage and its own shortcomings. And, but I continued my seeking and traveling in Latin America and, and, you know, a lot of amazing, amazing things, but also getting caught up in, in drug abuse and so forth. And a lot of very us versus them thinking, and justified, you know, got so, I think it was when uh, Richard Nixon was reelected to a second term. That's, I, I was just out of here. I left the country and living as an expat and justified having this outlaw lifestyle. And, um, uh, you know, just a lot of internal justifications and, and self-medicating around the cognitive dissonance with alcohol and drugs and so forth. And but along with that, there was always a through line of being a spiritual seeker. And I was living high in the mountains, in the, the Andes Mountains in 1974, trying to practice meditation on my own. And uh, having kind of focused on Tibetan Buddhism as my most, you know, where I had the most interest, even though I really had been exploring everything. And there weren't a lot of books. There were basically four or five books that had been published at that point. And uh, at some point, someone wandered up to my place uh, up in a very remote valley in Peru and brought a copy of Rolling Stone magazine uh, that had a big feature story about their very first summer session at Naropa University with Trump from Shame with Ram Das, And, uh, and just something about that completely grabbed me. And when I saw Trump from Shay's name, I was, it just kind of literally grabbed me by the throat and I knew I had to go there. So eventually I did. And I enrolled at uh, then Naropa Institute now Naropa University and earned my master's degree in, in psychology there. It was a Buddhist and Western psychology and psychotherapy training, a, a very intense kind of three-year clinical program, actually. Did and you with an flee, extensive internship. Did, mm -hmm. Just wondering, did you go, did you attend that ne first Naropa session with uh, Ram Das Trungpa? No, I was in Peru at the time. Uh -huh. I, okay. I, I had many friends who did it, but I was in Peru, so I read about it in Rolling Stone magazine. And uh, they, they found me way in the remote uh, mountains of Peru. So anyway, I, I managed to get up there uh, the following spring and check it out and decided I want a program I wanted to do. And along the way, my son was born. Uh, his mom was from Peru. And and uh, I finally enrolled. And at any rate, in that way, I got very involved with uh, becoming a student of Shogun Trung from Shea and really keeping in my path as well as continuing my education. But I still had this shadow life going on, both in terms of my own drug abuse and in terms of financing my lifestyle through periodic drug smuggling which I kept a secret from others and from my teacher and everyone else. And anyway, that program actually landed me in prison and with a, a 14 year uh, federally funded sabbatical of sorts. <laughs> That's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. And, but I went in with a lot of skills, you know, I've been 
trained as a, a meditation teacher. I had a master's degree in uh, really kind of a clinical program in psychotherapy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of experience, and a lot of skills. So uh, even though prison is an incredibly debilitating per- situation for most people, most people come out worse than they went in. For me, I was able to turn it into a very transformational journey for myself. And that is all on its own, an amazing accomplishment. And obviously, karmas uh, were some good some scars, as they say. Mm-hmm. So, but not only were you there, and I'd, I'd like you to just say a little bit more of that, because you know this is, of course, in the extreme, the kind of experiences one has in, in such a place. Uh, mm-hmm but they do mirror our day-to-day lives. And, um, and I know that you got a sentence, a much longer sentence, though, although you, you spent 14, 15 years, whatever, right? You got a 30-year mm-hmm. sentence. Originally, 30-year no-parole sentence. I was sentenced under the so-called kingpin statute. I, if I had been a kingpin, I'd probably have money stashed in Switzerland that I don't. <laughs> I've been, yeah. been out, out for 20 years trying to make a buck every day, so uh, like everybody else. so. Um, but uh, but anyway, I was the one that wouldn't testify against anybody, so I became the designated target. And uh, and I was sentenced, fortunately, before 1987 under the, what's called the old law in the federal system. And so at that time, even there was parole, which later they got rid of. But my sentence was a no parole sentence, and I was convicted of that. And given I had an aggregate sentence, it was, there were five counts, and they all added up to 30 years. and. So uh, it took me a while till I, when I got sentenced, I was 35. The paper said I'd be 65 before I had any chance of release. And that's what I thought the deal was. And I, I was actually in prison for a while. It took me a while to figure out how the system worked. And I realized that with good time on the 30 years, if I stayed out of trouble, I would serve about 18 and a half. And that was a combination of statutory good time that you receive automatically. You could lose it by getting in trouble in prison. And also what they call extra good time or work good time, which you get by keeping a job while you're in prison. So that still felt like forever at that point, as you can imagine. And of course, I had no surety that I'd stay out of trouble either. Um, At any rate, my appeal took about three years to go through the courts. And on appeal, they knocked off one count, a conspiracy count, which uh, is there to confuse the jury about the CCE, because that's just a more elaborate conspiracy count. And uh, it really should throw out the conviction and you should get a new trial, but they don't. They just drop that. And so anyway, that reduced it to 25, which was a relief. Uh, that meant I'd serve 14 and a half if I stayed out of trouble, which still felt like forever at that point. Um, but yeah, so that's what I, I did. end up serving the 14 years inside and then the, the six months in a halfway house and on house arrest. But the, the most painful thing about all of that, even though, you know, prison is, is um uh, um it's a very dark place in so many different ways but it was really uh that my son was nine years old when i got locked up and the realization that i was leaving him without a dad that he was going to grow up without a dad and having to face all the incredible selfish decisions i've been making for so long and justifying for so long of putting him at risk putting his mom at risk and and his life at risk and uh so i was devastated by that i was devastated by what i how i let down my community and my teacher and my family I was devastated by what I'd done to myself, but more than anything about what I'd done to my son. And I just became radically dedicated to get any negativity out of my life and to try to do something with my time there to leave a better legacy for my son than just his dad went to prison or even maybe his dad died in prison. So I I was really practicing like my hair was on fire and I was radically motivated to just find some way to add value to that place where I was living. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. That part of the, the karma of having a child. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, but there, uh, can you tell us a little bit about where your perspective was on a day-to-day basis as much as it could be mm-hmm. related to dealing with fear? Let's yeah. Start, yeah, just with that. Well, I spent seven months in a county jail during my trial and sentencing, and it was really an awful place. <laughs> dangerous place and an awful place claustrophobic noisy crazy i I barely slept for seven months i was in a pretty disturbed state and i was experiencing a lot of fear and of course hearing constant war stories in a kind of jail about prison and i'd see my share of prison movies and so i'm having nightmares about being attacked nightmares about being raped 
and uh, felt a lot of fear. When I actually got to the federal prison where I did my time, and I went through a couple of them in transit that were really rough looking places. But where I ended up was the U.S. Medical Center for Federal Prisoners, which is in Springfield, Missouri. And it's the maximum security federal prison hospital. There's three or four or five hospitals in the federal prison system. This one is the maximum security one. So the patients that are brought there, both medical and psychiatric, come from the federal penitentiaries like Lewisburg and Leavenworth and Atlanta and Lompoc and others. So uh, I was in a general population there, which is generally medium security. So either people were sentenced there at a medium security level or people have worked their way down out of the penitentiary down to this place by good behavior and they're finishing out their time in this place. It was still, it was definitely a maximum security prison and it was a very rough place. It wasn't as rough as being in some place like Leavenworth, but it was rough enough. And, uh, but still getting there out to the county jail was a big relief. There were 10 buildings. So they're all connected to these walkways or outdoor yards where you could go out and run and walk. There was, uh, activities. You could get a job. There was a, a weight room. There were, there were things to do, you know, compared to being locked in a little county jail, hellful of a place. So. So that was a big relief. But also what I immediately became aware of, and as you can imagine, I was pretty absorbed in the drama of my own situation at that point, having just been sentenced to 30 years with no parole and thinking that meant 30 years. But when I got there and I was just surrounded by this world of suffering, you know, I just saw men being wheeled around in wheelchairs, emaciated from cancer and AIDS. Uh, men who were blind being guided around, you know, with a walking with a, uh, you know, the typical cane situation or being guided around men who were paraplegics and quadriplegics in prison. And then men in the psychiatric wing, many over medicated. You'd see them one day. Okay. And the next day they're talking to the trees and talking to themselves or doing the Thorazine two-step. And I mean, it was just a world of such hellacious suffering. And, um, so that kind of just shook me out of my own drama. And fortunately, the influence of my teacher, Twin Prim Shea, and really my family upbringing and a lot of influences, I just realized, okay, I'm here. I got to find some way to show up and serve in this place. And I just became very motivated to do that. I mean, I could have found a little job, you know, being an orderly somewhere that would have taken like an hour a day to do and just spent all the time in my bunk, maybe reading books or writing a great American novel or just kind of done that. But I was just compelled to show up. So I got a job in the school teaching. That was my job for 14 years. I was a school teacher, nine to five, Monday through uh, nine to four, Monday through Friday. And uh, helping um, men who couldn't read, learn to read, uh, helping men get their GD in Spanish and English, teaching ESL. That was my day job, helping men who were doing college, correspondent college classes, tutoring them, that kind of thing. And I was, uh, I had an education, I was bilingual, so it was easy for me to get a job in a school. So that was my day job. And, um, you know, I also, once I got there, I realized that anything I was going to be able to do in a positive there where it was going to come out of my practice, my practice had to be first. So initially I was in these very large dorms, 28 man dorms up on a top bunk, uh, worked my way down to 24 man dorms, 18 man dorms, 12 man like that. And extremely noisy, chaotic places, especially at night. And uh, but I would sit up on the top bunk. I would keep the top bunk, even though you know it's preferential to get to the lower bunk because you could sit up there without people noticing you so much, and there was clearance to sit, and meditate. Then I found I could clear out the trash closets at the entryway to these dorms, and I'd take a chair in there and sit for hours. And even though in the summertime it was like a sauna, I'd just be pouring in sweat. But I was just, you know, I was practicing a couple hours every day during the week and, and practicing three, four, five hours at times on weekends. And I was just determined to do that. And the other part I realized that what had really been missing from my life, I think like a lot of us in the 60s and 70s, what had drawn us to Eastern religion and that kind of spirituality, been the awareness and the mind stuff, right? And of course, a lot of us were involved with the psychedelics and all the rest of it as well. I certainly was. But I had given short shrift to the ethical part of the Buddhist tradition and the precepts. And even though I'd taken temporary precepts for summary teaching programs, I really had not embraced that. And I realized now that was really what was missing. And I decided to completely build my life there in prison, grounded in the in the precepts. And I actually had the opportunity to formally take precepts with Trang Rumshe when he came a few years later to do some empowerments for me. So my life was focused around service and practice and study. Uh, at nine o'clock, we had to go back to our unit and we were locked down and counted. And I would study for a couple hours every night. And then once the lights were out, I'd sit and practice for two or three hours. 
And I didn't sleep much then. I only needed to sleep four or five hours a night back then. And then I'd get up early in the morning and practice and uh, uh, before before it got light. And uh, I was, you know, I was just driven. I was just driven, you know, I was devastated. Driven. I had a tremendous longing and devastation around my teacher who died. Trump Prabhupada died two years into my sentence in April of 1987. So it was just a lot of fuel for practice. Did he actually come to prison? He did, and I was on the phone with him several times. Um, and uh, he was quite ill then. And uh, uh, his main Dharma successor, um, Ursul Tenzin, uh, came uh, once I, I finished my Nundro, the preliminary practices in the Tibetan tradition. That I should have finished long before I went to prison, but with my lifestyle, I never did. Spent a lot of time in retreats and programs, but was never a good daily practitioner before I went to prison, off and on. So I hadn't finished my, even my, I'd done about 20,000 prostrations. So I finished my Nundro and was ready to, to uh, go forward on the Kagyu Nyingma Tibetan path and receive Abhisheka. And, and uh, so uh, when I finished the prostrations, the region came and gave me the rest of the Nundro transmissions. Uh, that was probably two, a year and a half into my sentence. And then Trang Rinpoche came uh, uh, and did the Bajogini Abhisheka for me, and I took novice vows with him as a monk. And then later on, uh, Sakyami Pomeramshe came to do further empowerments for me. And also my Zen teacher, Bernie Glassman, visited me quite often in the latter years, once I started studying with Bernie as well. Mm-hmm. Oh. So people were very generous. I mean, this was Springfield, Missouri. It's kind of an out-of-the-way place. Yeah. One of the buckles of the Bible bed. It was not a hotbed for the Dharma at all. <laughs> Oh my! This is quite a quite a story, Lee. Wow! And uh, you know, I back in the day, I was, actually was familiar with people where these kinds of things happened, and and many of them did not. That, as you said in the very beginning, most people do not come out of this well. Mm-hmm. And so to hear your story is to really appreciate. Um, uh, I mean, there are so many conditions that make up, in my mind, that make up a person being able to turn something like this in a way that maybe most people don't. And I'm sure of it from past lives, this life, and so on. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when I asked you, what is your perspective while you were there regarding the fear and the paranoia and all of the stuff, the suffering? And uh, your comment was, show up and serve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that is a key thing in terms of our daily lives, where, you know, many of us go through things that aren't as dramatic as what you went through, but they're dramatic for everybody in their own subjective world. And Mm -hmm. when His Holiness talks about developing compassion, this is the way to show up Mm -hmm. as humans you know so your lesson here i mean was so profound and powerful it's uh, it's it's really great i was was very motivated by the suffering around me i was also motivated by my own suffering um um and i also saw um you know when uh Shortly after arriving in prison, I'm even in county jail, I'm hearing all the kind of stories you hear from your fellow prisoners. But once I got into prison, the way, when you met somebody new, usually you'd walk the track together. And, and the ritual was they, they share their victim story, you share your victim story. And every prisoner's got a story, you know. And, you know, my fall partner screwed me over and my lawyer did me in this, you know. And yeah. and after hearing a couple of those and hearing my zone several times, I was like, I want to know more of that, which was not very compassionate or empathic of me. But I, I just, it's not where I wanted to go. And also in prison, you know, the vast majority of prisoners are just, you know, the minute you get arrested, you're just buried with shame and guilt. It's a demonization and shaming process. So naturally, instinctually, just to protect ourselves, just to sort of, we, most prisoners armor themselves with anger and bitterness and um, just to survive. And so all you got to do is just ask somebody right, the right question. Out comes all this anger and victim narrative and so forth and bitterness. And, and I, just, that's not, I didn't want to end up that way. I didn't want to come out of prison an angry, bitter person. And I didn't want to live that way while I was there. 
And I realized, and this really became the roots of this radical responsibility model that I've recently released a book of finally, is that I realized that the only way out or through for me was to just embrace 100% or 200% responsibility for having got myself into that situation. And I certainly, you know, I earned my way there. Now, there was a lot of people contributed to me ending up being targeted and getting the kind of sentence I did. And I I had all kinds of people I could blame, fall partners, and the government cheated in every possible way in my prosecution, all that. I could have focused on all that. I just decided to put all that over there and say, I got myself here. And the only way I'm really going to transform and get through this is just to radically own the whole thing, right? So that became a guiding force. And that was really in alignment with my Dharma training and with especially the precepts practice and the monastic practice. And so that that became part of it. And you know, I also like, I've always liked Ken, Ken Wilber's work has been a big influence for me. And I love his, his simple depiction of wake up, grow up, clean up, and show up, right? So, you know, I was doing all of that. I, I knew I had substance abuse issues. I immediately got involved in the 12-step programs there. We had a great AANA group, a great outside sponsors coming in. So I was a, an anchor for that group for 14 years. I started teaching uh, mindfulness in the uh, uh in the chapel. So we had a twice a week Buddhist meditation group in the prison chapel that I sourced. Uh, because of the tremendous suffering there, another inmate and I started the first hospice program in a prison anywhere, a couple, two, three years into it, and trained other people. And it became a national model. I started a national organization while I was in there. Now there's hospice programs in about 75 or 80 prisons in this country. And and so I spend most of my free time up in the hospital wards. And I hate hospitals, actually, quite frankly. But I spent my time up there in the hospital caring for men who were dying of AIDS and cancer. This was the height of the AIDS epidemic, right? And they were bringing all the AIDS patients from the whole federal system to this place. And they were dying in horrific conditions. Um, this was before the protease inhibitors. And people got every opportunity to get infection you could imagine. And, and that was incredibly transformative work to enter into another's life and to earn their trust. And... And realizing there, but for the grace of whatever, go go you, obviously. And some of our patients were younger than us. Some were older, some were the same age. Actually, I knew very well I could have AIDS. I've been very promiscuous. Um, I've been an IV drug user. And I had not been tested yet. And I remember I was there with one of my patients, Lyle. And uh, we became really, really close friends. And it was really a, a tough learning experience for me because Lyle was amazing. He he was interested in meditation. He'd never formally joined any lineage, but he was always interested and he was practicing and he got to know me in a group. He was there for treatment, was kind of okay. Then they sent him back to another prison. And when he came back, he was frail and really in his death process. And he lasted another nine months. And I was with him every day. And incredibly beautiful man who never complained, was very kind to the staff, the nursing staff, but was just heartbroken. He had a son the same age as mine on the outside. He also had a daughter about a year younger. And of course, as he would sit there and talk about his son, you can imagine what I'm going through. We'd both been pilots. We'd both been IV drug users. We had a lot, of, lot in common. And, um, you know, going through that journey with him and, and being able to hold space for him and, and realize that my job was to show up for him. And, uh, and you know, he would, he would go back and forth between between the sweats and the shakes and the shivers and at every opportunity, but just tremendous suffering. And so that work was incredibly transformed because, you know, you knew it could be you. And at that point, I still had not been tested for AIDS. And eventually I did go get tested in prison. And fortunately, I, I, I was not HIV positive. Um, turns out I was hep C positive, which I still am, but they think it's a false uh, they think it's a false positive because it's been for a long time, but a lot of people were dying of, of hep C while I was in prison. In fact, one of my other Buddhist patients uh, died of hep C. But this is incredibly transformative work for myself and others because you're really um, getting out of yourself and completely focusing yourself on some, what someone else is needing and on their suffering. So that was an incredibly transformative part of the journey. So all these things I was helping me grow up, I mean, Getting locked up really woke me up in a way that I had been not quite woken up before. All these processes were part of growing up and, you know, the 12-step work of cleaning up, cleaning up my act, and then being able to show up and, and, and show up for others. Yeah, the, the radical responsibility 
is uh, that's a great title. I, I don't know if you know this, but there's a, a wonderful story of Ramdas. Uh, we used to go to Tale of the Tiger when it was called that, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, one day Trungpa pulled Ramdas and told him, "Stand up and come, come here, and come by my side." And he kept saying to him. You know, Ramdas, you got to be responsible, huh? Ramdas going for what? Who's responsible? Is there a, someone there that that's a responsible? You know, all of this stuff yeah. coming from our tradition to the gurus. You know, is the uh, he's responsible? Okay, I'm just doing. You know, so it was a wonderful back and forth okay. uh, around that that I've and Ramdas and I still mention that and that uh, yeah, radical responsibility and of course the way you were this wasn't a choice basically you know so well it was a choice it was a choice maybe it was a choice of choice given my background choice it was a choice, choice. Yep. and uh you know what i the the thing that's really important the distinction is really important to make is when i'm talking about radical responsibility radical ownership it's complete outside the context of shame and blame it's letting go of that paradigm altogether so it's not about blaming ourselves it's certainly not about blaming others or blaming our circumstance and it's not about blaming victims it's just, you know, given any circumstance I might be facing, whether I can see I had a head in creating it or not, you know, at some point the second question is, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to let it take me down? Or am I going to find the most creative way I can respond to this to move forward for my own benefit and others? And that may be a heroic choice to make at some point. And it's not about, you know, we need to have tremendous compassion for ourselves and tremendous compassion for others in terms of the incredibly challenging, and tough, and often incredibly unjust circumstances people face in their life. So this is not about that. It's 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 really just about choosing where to put my energy, uh, and and where's where do we have the most self agency? Where where do we really have the most power? And uh, you know, I corresponded with Ram Dass a bit while I was in prison. And um, really, I didn't. That. Yeah, and it was, I was very connected, of course, with Bo Lawsoff, who took on Ram Dass's prison work. Bo and Sita, they were very close friends of mine. Mm. And I corresponded with Ram Dass a little bit, and. Uh, also, uh, a lot of people from back in the day, Stephen Levine, who Stephen Levine became, uh, um, uh, Stephen and Andrea were, were on the board of uh, advisors for both National Prison Hospice Association and Prison Dharma Network. And, uh, and when I got out, I had the great good fortune to be with Ram Dass a number of times. And I, one time I was at a conference out in Santa Cruz Mountains, and I got to sit next to him while we watched Fierce Grace and holding his oh, hand really? through the whole, through the oh, whole film. Oh, my. And, uh, and it, it was just really, a, 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 I have a photo of it, which I treasure, really a beautiful, oh, that's beautiful so... moment. So he was always a tremendous inspiration to me. Interestingly enough, in his early days, when he was out there doing the Ram Dass, you know, kind of tour, it was, I, for whatever reason, probably karmically, I'm more connected to Buddhism than I am to Hinduism, because, you know, even though I was a hippie and everything back in the day, I was less attracted to the, the, the more kind of flower child looking Hindu presentation, let's say, I don't know if that's fair to say, and the more, you know, or whatever but at that point where he made that shift and involved in creating the seva foundation and i really made his shift into karma yoga and and you know he became one of my great heroes really mm. days i was I, he was some way he was a hero back then but he he most became really a guiding light and hero to me when when he really embraced the path of karma yoga and, mm. and uh i thought that was uh yeah, anyway, he's a great hero of mine. That's great, great story. Uh, now, everybody out there, because we, on Mind Rolling, we talk a lot about uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. Mm-hmm. He was a great teacher of ours as well. And he, yeah, he used to call us the Love and Lighters. They're back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and had always had that dialogue, especially with Ram Dass. Um, but he also knew our lineage uh, from Neem Karoli Baba was a beyond Hinduism, Buddhism, or any of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, we had a great relationship. And there's a wonderful quote here. I just have to read this from. I don't remember uh, reading this and, uh, from uh, Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. So, even though you all have heard about it and heard me talk about this great Lama. Uh, Here's something uh, that really gives you some insight into his powerful way of elucidating the ancient teachings 
so that we can get it in the West. He's the probably one of the best, if not the best, at, at, at doing that kind of a thing. In spite of all of our problems and confusion, all our emotional and psychological ups and downs, there is something basically good about our existence as human beings. We have moments of basic non-aggression and freshness. We have an actual connection to reality that can wake us up and make us feel basically, fundamentally good. This is a, it sounds like a direct, you know, simple statement. This is probably one of the hardest things for especially Westerners to get. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, it was very much at the core from from Shay's teaching. Um, you know, when I was during my time in Princeton, prison, interestingly enough, I mean, I'd been involved in that path for a long time, been a very close student of his, been lucky to become one of his close attendants and travel with him a lot. And uh, so I always, you know, I very much wanted to believe in basic goodness and, and probably to some extent I did, uh, my own and others. And uh, But I was born in Missouri, you know, and I had good rational skeptical education in Missouri, the show me state, you know, I would be a classic doubting Thomas type. And so in prison, you know, there were a lot of characters, both among my fellow prisoners and, and the correctional officers who you kind of wondered, <laughs> you know. And so I had this uh, ongoing sort of research project of tracking kind of individuals who I thought, I wondered if they really did have basic goodness or any redeeming uh, virtue at all. And every time I thought I finally had my man, this is a male prison, and most of the staff were male, not all of them, but most of the guards were. And you know, every time I thought, I, okay, I've, I've got them. You know, here's here's a human being who there's no way they have basic goodness. They would inevitably show their heart to me in some way. Inevitably, it happened every single time. Some of the most, you know, bitter, negative, hate-filled guards, you know, at some point when I thought I'd finally, you know, they would somehow reveal their vulnerability in their heart in some way. And I finally gave up the project. So today I have a deep, deep experiential faith in my own innate goodness, the innate goodness of all beings and, and the innate goodness of society, really human society that, you know, with all our problems, even with all the, you know, everything we want to rail against, whether it's governments or the banks or corporations or whoever it is we want to pick on, you know, it all came out of human beings just coming together and figure out how do we do this? How do we organize? How do we organize ourselves? How do we distribute resources? How do we take care? And of course, greed and different things set in and institutions take over and they get fear-based but it all comes out of a natural human impulse. And, and when you look at human beings all over the world, what do they, 99% of them get up and do every day. They get up and take care of themselves, their kids, their families. We queue up at the well or at the store. We drive on the right side of the road. We're naturally very partnering and cooperative unless fear sets in. Of course, when fear sets in, then other things can arise. But if we can, you know, if we can find ways to be resilient, create resilient communities and 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 create, you know, lower the fear levels within humanity, you naturally get uh, very kind and loving and compassionate and cooperative behaviors. That's, I, I, I love that. And as you were, of course, saying these words, I had this image come in my head. And when we talk, and there is that beautiful little section that you talk about the guards and mm -hmm. thought there was no possibility of any humanity. And then suddenly, as you just said, boy out of the blue which boy that's living proof all uh, right now i'm someone who goes to auschwitz every year i've been going there for 20 years every year and with the zen peacemakers right, and we do our me. retreat every november and i and i've done two bearing witness retreats from rwanda and trained genocide survivors there so you know i have and i go in and out of prisons all over the world all the time in maximum security prison so you know i really believe in, in looking right into um the most hellish aspects of our humanity. But I, I really see the violence as uh, not, not as uh, innate to our humanity. But for me, it's more like a, a virus that we just circulate around within, a fear-based virus that we circulate around within humanity and is perpetuated by acts of violence and, and so forth. And, and I feel like if we really want a more peaceful and less violent world, we need to drain the swamp. Um, and have more and more children grow up without shame, to find ways to educate and enculturate our children without shame and coercion, to prevent all the abuse and acts of abuse and neglect and violence that we can, so that we have more and more people who are more and more resilient. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's doable, but we have to be proactive about it. Otherwise, to think that the world is ever going to be more peaceful and less violent is kind of wishful thinking. Yeah. 
course, but again, that doesn't mean it's in human nature. It's just we're both set up. You know, even the, what job one for any species? Survival, of course. So our our neurobiology is set up to pay more attention to threat. Our long term memory is mostly full of negativity because of that. But we're also hardwired for altruistic behavior. We get all kinds of neurological payoffs for altruistic behavior. And if we consciously focus on cultivating the positive in our life and opening our hearts, we can actually change our brain and we can become very resilient and much more deep, have much more of a default propensity to gentleness and kindness and compassion and so forth. So there is that thing in the human condition, but I don't think it's really endemic. It's just you have a body. And the body wants to survive. So you, it perpetuates this fear and survival mindset. But we also have completely have the capacity to override that. And that capacity comes from somewhere deeper. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, though, so, uh, Fleet, when you did say drain the swamp, again, that image came up in front of my, in my head, the image of that person that is the, our president currently. <laughs> And yeah, it came he, up he before when you were talking didn't exactly about drain the swamp, did he? <laughs> uh, there's nothing being drained. Uh, there's the hungry ghost thing going on with him big time. But uh, and also it came up when you were talking about the prison guard that eventually there was something that you directly experienced that showed real humanity. And as His Holiness said, we all want the same thing. Yeah, we happy all want to be safe, secure, suffer. and happy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to see uh, uh, Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's humanity. Um, you know, I mean, I think easy. I think, rel- I think he's a relatively confused individual. I think he's probably pretty wounded from his childhood. I suspect, and uh, you know, he's operating out of fear and survival at a pretty grandi- grandiose level. Um, but you know, it's if if you pay attention, you can see his humanity as well. And uh, you know, I think. Uh, Given the right conditions, um, you know, actually, uh, Trump just uh, signed the first significant criminal justice reform bill in decades. Uh, that's actually going to allow people. It's going to bring good time back into the federal prison system. You know, I, I was lucky to get all that good time after 1987. The only good time was 54 days a year that you earned by staying out of trouble. So if I've been sentenced to 30 years. After 1987, to a no, well, everything was no parole then. I would have had to serve at least mm, 26 and a half, 27 years on that 30. And the only way out would be a presidential pardon. So, uh, so Trump actually signed a bill recently. And, you know, oddly enough, in the weird, our weird popular culture, you know, I think, uh, uh, was it uh, Kim Kardashian was involved and some other stars were involved in convincing him to, to do it. And, uh, you know, so there you go. Who, who, who's? Uh, we never thought, um, you know, uh, that President Trump would be a, a positive figure for criminal justice reform. But there, there you go. Mm. I do remember that actually, when you mentioned Kim Kardashian and, and yeah, now he's doing a lot of other things that are not so great, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it's good to have some perspective that isn't so polarizing that we are all doing on a day-to-day basis around mm-hmm. all of this. So. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's tons of stuff in the in the book that are there are wonderful practices and opportunities to get a new perspective and in particular one that on uh, I think goes a long way to really helping again on a day to day basis for people in their lives uh, and that it, it's early in the book the power of empathic awareness and talking about um, uh, you know, emotional intelligence, which uh, mm-hmm. Danny Goldman wrote many years ago. And Danny is part of uh, us mm-hmm. going over to yeah. India to meet Nim Karoli Baba and so on. But um, we, I haven't really talked about I think this is a great thing for people to delve into. So, um, yeah, talk about what is emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Well, it's... Um... It's emotional intelligence has to do with awareness of our emotional life and our emotional body. And um, so Goldman's four quadrants are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship management. So, you know, self-awareness is just becoming more aware of kind of what makes us tick physiologically, neurobiologically, emotionally, cognitively, and uh, being more and more familiar with that really through contemplative practices, mindfulness practices really being more in our body and more awake and more aware 
So we're really getting to understand ourselves. We're, 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 we're not being kind of dragged around by our conditioning. We're actually in our body and awake to what's going on. And so we're learning constantly. We're learning all the time. We're aware of what our emotional triggers are. We may have some sense of how we got them. Uh, we're in the process of transforming them and at least being able to manage them and, uh, and developing greater and greater self-empathy and self-compassion and self-awareness. You know, a lot of when you see really negative human behaviors, whether it's self-destructive or other destructive behaviors, that's coming out of someone's internal landscape. It's very impoverished. It's full often of a lot of self-hatred, a uh, complete lack of self-agency, an inability to self-empower. Uh, a, a sense that everything good is out there, all power is out there, all rewards out there. And so it's a very impoverished internal landscape with a lot of negative core beliefs. And uh, out of that, of course, what you're going to get is self-destructive and other destructive impulsive behaviors. So through awareness practices, we're transforming that inner landscape and really learning to empower ourselves and understand ourselves. And, you know, that's really the beginning of developing more and more emotional intelligence. And there's a lot of wisdom in our emotions. and so. Uh, our ability to really make good decisions in life needs to be informed by what we're feeling. We're actually pretty emotional decision makers. A lot of us think we'd make, you know, even buying a car, we do all this research and we do all, you know, read consumer reports and we get all this research. And, and, and then we go on the car, like, I want the blue one, right? Because it makes me feel good, right? We're, we're emotional decision makers. And so being able to understand our own emotions and the feelings of others and having a general, a genuine compassionate interest in in what we're feeling and needing what others are feeling and needing right and you know this is the ground of of really genuine relationship and authentic relationship so in the first part of the book i really i start with a chapter on basic goodness right getting across this idea that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with us we're not broken we don't need fixing and there is a deep reservoir of innate confidence we can tap into in the depth of our being and then the mindfulness practices is a vehicle for doing that and also a vehicle for just being in the driver's seat of our own life. And then the emotional intelligence chapter. So all those three are kind of this, a lot of the work I do, I call it mindfulness-based emotional intelligence. So that gives us a foundation to then, you know, to really do the work. Um, you know, and then the other chapter, I go into what is the human condition? How did we get to where we are? How do we actually rewire ourselves for more resilience and, and better performance? And then, then I get into the actual core distinction between the drama zone, the empowerment zone, the whole radical responsibility distinction. But the foundation really is cultivating mindfulness and awareness and cultivating greater emotional intelligence so that we're, you know, it, it, we're just getting better information about ourselves in an empathic way. And so we're able to act more intelligent with, with ourselves. We're getting better, more and better data about the world around us in an empathic way. So we're able to interact with the world more skillfully. So we just naturally interact with ourselves and the world around us more compassionately, more empathically, more skillfully because we're getting the right data. We're not just operating, you know, in the cloud of our own conditioning, our fear-based conditioning in a reactive way. We're, we're able to respond to life instead of living in a constant kind of me mechanical reactivity. There's also this uh, social awareness. Uh, and there's uh, something you say about, um, which is focused on developing a number of, of competencies related to others. Empathy, mm -hmm. caring, organizational awareness, and having a service orientation, mm -hmm. which goes back to show up and serve. And so this is highly important as far as I'm concerned. I, and I really got my emotional intelligence training in prison in a big way. I mean, I wasn't the most emotionally unintelligent person before I went to prison. I just had some blind sides and shadows, obviously, that I was dealing with. But I'd done a lot of work. But still, in prison, it was a whole major another, a whole nother realm of growth really in a dramatic way and you know you mentioned about the fear before so you know in in a prison there there's a major beef conflict violent incident just waiting around every corner all the time i lived on a floor designed for 50 human beings and we had 185 men no air conditioning and there was just stuff going down all the time and you know i i ended up in about six I'd say about six potentially violent encounters in 14 years that's not bad. Unfortunately, I was able to get through them all without getting killed or hurting somebody else. Um, but, uh, you know, there were times when I actually had to confront the situation. And um, but I probably avoided 10,000 situations, you know, just by being aware and learning how to carry myself in prison and not carry myself belligerently, which attracts, you know, uh, challengers. 
and not carry myself weakly or passively, which attracts predators, but to be in relationship with the pace and, and be in, and really tune into others. What is going on with others? And of course, learning to be a hospice caregiver, learning how to get things done in an environment, which was a maximum security prison where the answer to everything is no. And, you know, resistance is completely futile. You try to buck the system, you're back in the, in the, uh, um, psych ward and four point restraints on a concrete bunk getting hosed down at night, pump full of hell at all or Thorazine, literally. So how do you get something done in that kind of environment? Well, you have to get in relationship with people and, you know, everybody's got a relational human being button somewhere. You just have to find it. Right. And so, you know, I really learned, uh, that social awareness was key to just staying alive, but also became the key to actually being able to do positive things in that world and get things done and create new programs and, and, and so forth. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a really, I mean, it's, it's key to our life. We're social beings, right? We're social beings. Yeah, exactly. What there's this thing later on, uh, amygdala hijack. I don't Mm -hmm. know if I can say that right. Amygdala. Amygdala. And Mm -hmm. it's coined by Danny. Yeah. uh, refers to a sudden emotional flooding that is disproportionate to the actual stimulus. This sounds mm-hmm. extraordinarily familiar in my own. Yeah, I think it is for most of us. Yeah. yeah, we get triggered and we go right down the rabbit hole because what's getting triggered are past experiences, usually childhood stuff, and it's pretty hardwired into us. And, you know, the bottom falls out and we're just in this complete fear and survival-based reaction. And the reptilian brain, the avoidance mechanism is taking over. And to that extent, our executive function and neocortex is being disengaged. <laughs> and there's this emotional flooding. And the, the brain is saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And we don't have access to our rational decision-making capacity. And so we tend to do and say things that are not so smart. And so the key there is to get ourselves untriggered, to get regain access to the rest of our brain. Uh, you know, So we need to learn all kinds of state-shifting techniques, like just Counting to 10, right? The age old count, count to 10 or count to 100 when you're really angry, or jaw breathing, or belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, or just anything we can do that releases the grip of the reptilian brain, that fight or flight survival mechanism, regain access to the rest of our brain and realize, okay, what's actually going on here? What, what am I feeling? What am I needing? What can I do? What's the best way to respond to this for myself and others? And uh, that just takes practice, but it's, but it's very doable. Yeah. Um, we don't have much time left, but I, I did want to point to something that's dear to our tradition, dear to me, which is really the heart-mind mm-hmm. and the way in which the practicality of the combination of, of these, of wisdom and just opening in a way to true self and o- not avoiding pain that Def- definitively goes on when you get into that kind of opening process. Mm-hmm. And um, in this thing you call it cultivating the pro-social qualities of the heart-mind. And I, there, there's, you got a wonderful quote here from His Holiness, and it goes back to what we were talking about before. And uh, he says, from my own limited experience, I have found that the greatest degree of inner tranquility comes from the development of love and compassion. Ultimately, the reason why love and compassion bring the greatest happiness is simply that our nature cherishes cherishes them above all else. The need for love lies at the very foundation of human existence. It results from the profound interdependence we all share with one another. That concisely puts it all into vivid technicolor right well even at a neurobiological level the you know and as well as a spiritual level that's how we are part of an interdependent web uh, a relational web and whether we like it or not and when we live in denial of that we're cutting ourselves off from the energetic nurturing you know that when when we can actualize that and what one of the things we're learning today is that by developing deep embodiment and i really emphasize the way I guide meditation practice, a deep quality of, of embodiment, awakening what we call interoceptive awareness, the body's capacity to feel itself from the inside out. Right? The body is sensory from the surface of the skin all the way down to our bones. So really actualizing that, not experiencing it just when we're experiencing pain, but in an abiding, ongoing way. So we're 
we actually experience ourselves as deeply present and deeply alive, and others start to experience us that way as well. Well, we now know that the neural circuitry involved in that deeper level of embodiment and the direct experience of that, not just the noticing, but the direct feeling, being in it in a more non dual way, is connected to the same neural pathways that connect us to the inner subjective field with others. So we actualize ourselves as part of this interdependent web of humanity. And right, and, when, and the more connected we are in a relational space with our loved ones, with our friends, with our family, with our community, societally, with the world, and we're, we're open to that and acknowledging that, we can actually begin to tune in at that level. And we start to function really as a relational being, as a social being. And there's oceans of energy available to us, oceans of resilience, oceans of wisdom. But when we get cut off into this myth of being a skin encapsulated being here in my separate little self, we're cutting ourselves off from this ocean of wisdom, compassion, resilience, and love. You know, the experience that you went through and the way in which it formed you through those years and now and is uh, is is very powerful uh, example of the reality that doing the practice, showing up and serving and doing the practice. The it is true, everybody. We can move into a perspective that is not caught in our little selves, and uh, and we can be um, full of. Uh, equanimity, full of inspiration, full of what we as human beings, you know, in, in the part in the book, and we are, as Trump has said, we are pristinely good. And for us to be able to turn that around, to really understand that, and compassion for oneself really maybe is the beginning of that. Uh, you are showing this fleet in a way that's undeniable because of uh, the experience that you had. So it's really quite wonderful. I really appreciate um, you writing this book and, uh, and, and really give, giving uh, a, a real definition to that word, that term, responsibility. So well, I stumbled, in, stumbled into the right place at the right time, I guess. And, uh, you know, my, my Trung Paramche was a master of, analogies and metaphors for uh, meditation and one of them that he used was strong back soft front and strong back is is the work we do to wake up and grow up and clean up and stand on our own two feet and have integrity and equanimity and uh to be deeply rooted and to show up right and then soft front is that tender heart that tender vulnerable heart that's our relational being right so sometimes i think of that idea of indra's net you know where we're we're all nodes on this net where, you know, the information moves around every pearl or jewel and then it has all. So I often think that our job is to be a really good node on that net. So, you know, what to add more value to the net than we are taking from it. And then, so we have to take care of ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves to be a good node. And that's kind of the, the work of, uh, of uh, strong back. And then, and opening to that and really participating and realizing that our, even our sense of self, we think our sense of self is here. You know, if you ever experience a deep loss, you quickly realize your sense of self is not limited to you because your sense of self exists in your relational field. And when we have a critical loss, and I've had several, your sense of self takes a long time to reorder itself, which is what we call the grieving process. So we actually live in the relational field, whether we know it or not. And by embracing that, we can actually be a lot happier. Perfectly said. Thank you so much, Fleet. Really appreciate you being with us. This is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you slash Mind Rolling. And then you will be able to have links to this book and uh, Fleet's work and, and so on. And some of the other books that we've been talking about or, or uh, uh, these transcendent beings that we have been so wonderfully taken care of by, which is also a miraculous thing in this life. So uh, thanks again, and we shall see you all next week. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Thank you.